Hello. Everyone hear me all right? Uh, as Seth mentioned, I'm Vlad Grigorescu, currently at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, a lot of my work of late has been on integrating Bro with uh, Elasticsearch in an attempt to make your logs easily searchable and uh, a bit less painful to work with than the venerable text logs that everyone knows and loves and uh, is used to grepping through endlessly. <coughs> So to me, Bro is very unique in that it kind of gives you a, a different perspective on your data than the traditional IDSs and, and things like that, where uh, you can go and you can fight the political battles or buy hardware to set up and capture uh, traffic. Um, and then you're basically inundated by uh, this massive amounts of logs, which is usually an order of magnitude more than you may have expected. Um, and then you have all these logs, and you're, you're basically trying to go through and uh, determine what's legitimate and what's illegitimate. Um, and if, if you determine what's illegitimate, then you can go ahead and create detections for it. You can take actions on it. Um, or if you know that something's legitimate, you can whitelist it and basically just try to cut down on the borderline stuff that you actually have to sit uh, a human in front of to go through and sift through and try to determine what's actually going on. And the goal there is to get fewer of those borderline ones, so then you have the, cap the capability to get more logs, and the whole cycle kind of repeats. And um, Of course, the interesting bit in this is how do you split up the legitimate and the illegitimate. Uh, so to me, basically, if you know what you're looking for, you're, you're done. Um, you can go and create a notice, a signature, execute an action. Uh, you can log to a separate file, because of course you wouldn't want to be querying your main text file, because that takes too long. Um, and the really interesting question is, you know, I, I, I want to find the suspicious stuff, the stuff that I don't know about yet, the new attacks, the, uh, the things that are trending, and how do I do that? And if you're used to working with the ASCII logs, then you might end up with something like this, where you're grepping through and you're excluding, going, uh, that's probably good, that looks familiar, I know that, and that's something that I know I've had to iterate through hundreds of times, and I'll wait another five minutes for a grep and go, oh no, that, that one's good too, and then go and exclude that, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a pain. Um, and really what uh, I think the solution is, is to have an interactive interface where uh, someone can sit down and can actually sift through this and can just exclude massive swaths of data quickly to try to drill down to the more interesting data. And for something to be interactive, it has to be fast. Um, you're not going to sit there playing or doing a test query just for fun if you know that grep is going to take five minutes to get back to you. Um, so that's probably the most important thing to encourage that uh, the, the stuff that probably won't return anything interesting or you're just curious about and uh, want to get some more information on. Uh, the other thing that I think is necessary is to support complex queries where you know, regular expressions are tried and true and painful and everybody's kind of used to them to be able to um, try to look for more specific things, but uh, that really doesn't solve the problem entirely. Um, and then once you've found something suspicious, there needs to be some correlation in there. There needs to be some connection to other logs you have, other context you can build around the events for someone who goes in, finds something suspicious, and then wants to do some more in-depth investigation. That needs to be really simple, and uh, that can just be getting all data for, or all messages about this IP address, or looking plus or minus five seconds around this event, that kind of context that is really lacking with, uh, with plain text logs. So the first part to this is the fast queries. And, um, there's a technology called Elasticsearch, and they describe themselves as a distributed, restful search engine built on top of Apache Lucene. Uh, Apache Lucene is a uh, fairly well-established technology that aims to index massive amounts of data um, and make it available for search. It's really, really painful to actually get working and, and set up. Um, so kind of first and foremost, Elasticsearch tries to abstract all of that away and give you a good interface into this where you don't have to write your own custom Java library just to do what you're trying to do. Um, Lucene is a NoSQL 
uh, type database, so you can throw whatever you want at it. It'll, uh, it'll expand your tables. It'll add new fields. Um, and it's really flexible, and that's good, especially when we're talking about Bro, where you might want to change a script and start adding an additional column. You don't want to have to go in and modify your tables. So something a bit more fluid is really necessary there, because that's just how people have often work with Bro. So to break that up into uh, the pieces of its definition, uh, the distributed comes into play in that, let's say you have a node, which is just a computer running Elasticsearch. Um, and you have an index that you create where you want to shove all your data. Uh, Elasticsearch lets you split up this index into shards. Um, each of these shards is a self-contained Apache Lucene index. Um, and what this allows you to do is once you add a new node, Elasticsearch will go and load balance your shards over all the available nodes. Um, adding a new node is really stupid simple. Uh, out of the box, Elasticsearch has multicast auto discovery. So it has a hard coded multicast IP address where whenever a node gets spun up, it pings that IP and goes, hey, is anybody else a member of this cluster? And it does the usual master election and things like that. So. Um, just out of the box, if you start the Elasticsearch uh, jar, it'll go out, try to find other nodes, and create a cluster with them. Um, in terms of the actual interface, uh, so this is how you would index some new data into Elasticsearch, where you use the put method to add some data. You give it the address of one of your nodes. Uh, by default, it's running on port 9200. Uh, in this instance, bro test is the index that I have, and DNS is the type in the index. So in the traditional relational, re relational database model, your index is kind of like the database, and the type is the table. Um, it really helps for uh, all the messages in a, in a certain type to have more or less the same fields. It's better optimized that way. So I give it my index, I give it my type, and then I tell it to use the index verb. Um, and I just pass it a JSON object. Here I'm just setting two fields. Uh, one is the source with this source IP, and then and it was a query for google.com. Um, Elasticsearch takes all that data, creates a hash, and then uses that hash as a routing key to determine what shard that data will end up living in. Um, so what it will do is I send the request to one of the nodes, and it figures out, oh, this data will actually end up living in shard one. So it goes and pushes that data to shard one. Uh, that node will then go and insert it into the index. Once it's done inserting it, it returns back to the master node, and the master node returns back to you. So one uh, benefit of this is by the time you get your HTTP response back, the data has been successfully inserted into all the indices, indices that it needs to be inserted into. There's no kind of back-end replication. There's no master-slave you know that when you get your response back, the data is safely in the index, and you can delete it from your memory and move on. <clears throat> the other really neat thing that Elasticsearch gives you is the concept of replicas, of just copies of your data. Um, so you can change most settings in Elasticsearch on the fly. Uh, here I'm telling it that on the bro test index, change the settings, and again, passing a JSON object, almost everything's JSON. Um, and I tell it that for that index, set the number of replicas to one. And what this will do is it will start copying those shards. And it will try to load balance it so that uh, each node has a distinct set of shards. You don't have you know, your backup copy on the same node, essentially. Uh, and this is really useful in that if one of your nodes goes down, well, you're still up. So it really adds some redundancy here. Um, in that if I were to do another insert, um, it, I would just hit the other node and the data gets flushed there. If the first node ever comes back up, it'll push the new data back to it and they'll all kind of catch up to the same state. Um, the other benefit is that, uh, let's say I have four nodes and each have a single shard. Uh, I have the shards copied over one, so I have one replica. Um, and this really helps in terms of search, uh, in that if I were to execute a search, which again, I give it the index, I can optionally give it the type if I want to lock it down to a certain type, tell it to search with my query, 
um, Apache Lucene comes out of the box with 30 or 40 or 40 different query types, some stuff I'll never delve into. But basically, if you want to search for it, it, it can do it for you. Uh, here, I'm just looking for a source that contains the text 181.22. Um, so I'll send that to my master. Uh, and then it'll go out and load balance it over the available shards. And they'll fetch the results, send it back to the master. The master will do some, uh, you can, there, there are several post search operations you can do, sorting and faceting and uh, even create histograms and that type of thing. And once the master node actually goes through and does that on the entire data set, it returns the search to you. Um, so basically, the upside of all of this is that this is really simple to scale to whatever, however much data you're dealing with. Um, if you want to uh, index more data, then you just go and add nodes, and it load balances your shards over those nodes, and each node is only indexing 1 over n um, of the total. So the underlying indexing is now being based on Yes. Um, and then if you're concerned about uh, how fast your search will return, then you can go and create replicas and it'll load balance it to make sure that's hitting each shard only once. So here, because I have a replica, each node will only be doing half of the work for searches as it normally would be doing. Um, so a good way of pitching this is to go to your boss and ask them well, how fast you want searches to be. One second, half a second, quarter of a second. And then you tell them, OK, well, here's how much disk you need to buy. Um, so in terms of what you actually get back from Elasticsearch, this is a kind of truncated example. But there are some interesting points here. Um, you can see that it was searching about 98 million records, and it took 315 milliseconds. And that's over 76 total shards. Um, and the integration with Bro is such that uh, Bro makes some intelligent decisions about this is the type of data that this field is. It's an integer or a string or what have you. And it formats that in such a way that Elasticsearch will also interpret the correct format of that. So you can see here then the response, uh, the timestamps a, a double, uh, UID is a string, port numbers are integers. And even the answers is a list. Um, so it has some uh, non-basic core types that we're able to utilize with Bro, and that it'll uh, more or less know the right thing to do with your data. There are some caveats with this, which will hopefully be fixed down the line in the Bro plugin. Uh, the main one is that currently Apache Lucene doesn't support IPv6. So IP addresses are just being sent to strings. Um, that being said, you can still just do a normal string search on them. You can even do range queries um, where it'll sort the string uh, and return things in that range. But um, that, that'll hopefully get a lot better in, in the future. And even things like uh, things that are uh, host names, it should know to, for instance, for instance, with this, it should know to index com, AOL.com, and www.aol.com separately. And that's all supported by Apache Lucene. You can set that up in your Elasticsearch config. But really, Bro should be doing that for you behind the scenes automatically. So the other part of this was the complex query language. Um, so I'm not, is that readable? I'll, I'll go through it in either case. but. Um, so out of the box, these are some examples of how to use the Lucene query language for some common searches that uh, security folks might want to do. Uh, the first one's just your usual Boolean query with ands, nots, and ors, and parenthetical grouping. Um, it, can, it also has support for wildcards, uh, perhaps if you want to take a look at name servers from China that are doing things on your network. Um, it doesn't. Uh, have any support for start of field, end of field, those types of, uh, of wild cards. But um, a handy one for searching email is the ability to do a fuzzy search, uh, where it'll search for uh, similar words. And you can even specify how, uh, a degree of similarity that it should search for. 
Um, and also you can have a distance search where you're searching for two words separated by less than n words. And as I alluded to before, it does support range queries where you can search on a specific timestamp um, from this timestamp to this timestamp or from this timestamp to the current time. Or if you give it a string field, it'll sort those alphabetically and uh, do a range search on that. So where we are right now, <laughs> Uh, there's a Elasticsearch uh, logging writer plugin uh, in the Bro 2.1 beta. Um, and Elasticsearch gives you the RESTful web API that supports fast and complex queries. It always takes JSON in and always gives you JSON out. I've had to parse JSON to figure out the error message from Elasticsearch. And, um, but this combination is really makes it really simple to build custom tools around it. Um, and this was kind of the initial problem that I wanted to solve in that there's all this data and there's no really good way of accessing it. Um, and this combination of having the web API and having just simple JSON data lets you uh, integrate it pretty easily with the rest of your tools, hopefully. And finally, it's resilient and scalable. Um, if you add more nodes, you have faster indexing. Um, and if you add more replicas, you have faster searching. And really, that just comes down to uh, the cost-benefit analysis for uh, your team of how long do they want to be sitting around waiting for the search to return. The next step to this was actually building the interactive interface. I had been working on a project called Brownian, um, and this is just a pretty simple web application for interacting with your bro logs from Elasticsearch. Um, there are many other web interfaces out there, but this one's really specific to Bro, where it has knowledge about the field definitions, it knows uh, some additional context on the fields, um, and it also gets log metadata from Bro, so Bro will tell it, well, I created this index for you, which covers this time range, and uh, this was when I rotated that index out, and so on and so forth. And I'll, I'll touch on how exactly it does the indices and all that a bit later. Um, it also has a couple of actions, which I hope to expand upon for uh, things like, uh, I want to see all messages that have this IP address in any field that bro told me is an IP address field. Uh, so that's a quick way of just seeing all kind of related events with that IP address without getting false positives on text matches and DNS queries or whatever else that you might get if you just grep through your logs. Uh, and it can just do the uh, basically pivot on a, a certain time based on an event. So now for the actual demo. And uh, I, I should point out this is really designed to work at a higher resolution than 1024 by 768. So I'm going to be scrolling a bit since I figured that most people have monitors that might support something better than that. Um, so it, it's fairly simple. There's a drop down here to select which, indice, which indices you care about. Um, and then here you'll be able to give it a search um, to execute. Uh, down the side here are all the different log types that Bro sent. So each log type, usually each file you would get is stored in a separate type in Elasticsearch. Um, and then you have counts for how many messages matched uh, your query from each individual type. Um, so for example here I'm looking at the SMTP log and I see the same fields that I do in the ASCII logs in the same order that I'm used to them from the ASCII logs with timestamp, UID, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at software just out of curiosity. So just kind of following up on the example that I gave earlier, let's say that I want to take a look at what browsers people are using. So if I click this, then I have a few options where if I want to include that field, exclude it, or if I'm just looking on whether or not that field's null, and then this is just the action that it should take on the query that I currently have if I want to kind of build the query out over several steps. So right now I'm just going to replace my entire query with the fact that it's an HTTP browser. And let's say that I don't care about Firefox. So I'm going to say and not Firefox and not Chrome. 
and so on and so forth. I can build this out, um, and I see that I have 5,200 5, matching user agents, and I can continue drilling down into there. Um, and you know, you, you basically just keep building on your uh, the query that gets transferred uh, as you go through. Uh, by default, the, all your messages are, store, are sorted based on timestamp. Um, there's some confusion because Elasticsearch doesn't really know what to do if you want it to search on uh, a field that it, it'll try to analyze and split up into separate words. Uh, so by default, if you give it a field that has spaces or dots, it'll uh, try to separate those out as separate words and index each of them separately. Um, so currently, the, the sorting is only enabled on fields, on numeric fields, where it basically makes sense to be sorting on. Um, once Bro starts giving it more context on the, you know, this is how I want you to index this field, and this is how it should be searchable, that would be different. Um, so for instance, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at people running Python URL lib. Um, and again, all the all the standard fields that you're used to from Bro, and you can, uh, and let's say that you know I want to see what this IP is doing, so I'll take a look at anywhere that that IP shows up in an IP field, and it translates it to a an ugly query because Bro has many IP fields across the different types. So you can see that when and it pulled it out of the con log, HTTP known host, I can go and see what services are running on that um, on that system. Uh, looks like I even had a few notices for that system, which is interesting. Uh, cool, self signed cert and old Java. Awesome. Um, so let's say that I care about this invalid cert. Uh, what I can do is I can go ahead and drill down on this UID, and that's just an easy way to correlate across the different field types for that UID. Uh, so I can see the SSL details, and then I can actually go out and pull the connection details. And let's say that I want to see events in and around this time. I can go in through here and uh, take a look at um, events uh, plus or minus 25 milliseconds from there. Um, and I can take a look and see some other traffic. Um, the other really neat thing that it gives you uh, is that it tries to integrate the Bro documentation about the different fields. I have no idea what con state and history refer to if I don't have the documentation in front of me. Um, so if you hover over this, it gives you the Bro explanation of this is what this field is pulled from the comments. Um, and hopefully that, that should make it a lot more easier to use for people that aren't necessarily familiar with Bro and that just have access to this interface. Um, any questions on the demo? Other things that people want to see? Yep. Is there a way to save queries? Uh, kind of. They're all up in this horrible URL at the moment. <laughs> um, so I should say I, I've been working on this for maybe a month and a half, two months. I'm not a web designer, so it's just kind of a first stab and. Uh, a big part of this is I want to hear what people are looking for in this, and then we can try to kind of build that in. Um, saving queries and being able to see graphs, uh, time series graphs, are basically two of the biggest things that I hear. Um, but uh, yeah, at the very least, you, you can send the giant URL to a coworker, and they should be able to see the same thing you are. Um, And, and it's very much a, gee, this feature is really bugging me. Oh, fine, I'll go fix that bug type of thing. But uh, yeah, you were yep. committing four hours ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was just because I can't write HTML apparently. <laughs> and yeah, it is on GitHub. Uh, I'll have links at the end. Uh, I think if you just search for Brownian and Bro or Brownian and Elasticsearch, it should pop up pretty quickly. Uh, 
Brownian is really what I was going for as a nod to Brownian motion. And really, the idea is you have all this random data and trying to make sense of it. And, uh, it's going to work well with Brownian motion and the, the random elastic collisions there. But, uh, Okay, well, I'm going to kind of go in through what, what's actually needed for, for some of that, though. Uh, and yeah, that's something that I kind of hope to, to hear more about how people want to use it and, uh, you know, what you want on top of it. Do you want IP tables? Do you want to lock it down to which IPs are, are part of this? And really the downside to Elasticsearch being so simple to, to install and set up in this auto discovery is that you don't really want someone setting up their own Elasticsearch server and joining your cluster and getting access to your data. So there, there are some security controls that you can add on top of it, um, depending on what, what people, uh, what people want. If, if I want to pull in other types of logs into this, mm -hmm. how hard is that? Uh, so currently it has, it, it Bro creates a meta index of, of right. the, these are the indices and these are the times that these indices cover. Um, and basically you can specify log rotation and it'll create an index per three hours or two hours or whatever your log rotation is. Um, so really, for it to see it, Bro needs to have touched it first. So get Bro to pull it in. Yeah. Then pull it in. Yep. Got it. Yep. Yep. I, I can make this visually in memory. Are there like to get the same performance as the uh, code, the app code thing? Um. It depends on how you set it up. So basically, when when you start up Elasticsearch, you tell it, uh, you tell it, it's just a Java um, program and you tell the JVM how much memory it should grab. Um, so it will try to do some really aggressive caching in memory, both if it's indexing new data to limit the number of disk writes, and if you're searching new data, it will try to bring as much into memory as you can. Uh, you can specify indices that should live in memory only, and uh, I know some people that uh, their current index is only in memory and they flush it out to disk once that index gets closed out. Um, You'll definitely see some performance hits if you're if you have a cold cluster as it loads everything into memory. But um, yeah, I've been I've been pretty impressed with its performance and and uh, it, it's really tunable. Um, and I'm curious to see how people are going to start working with it and playing with it in terms of um, their nodes. You can even specify that you know this index should live on these beefier boxes that have more RAM, uh, maybe for your, your last day's worth of data or something like that. And then as they age out, you can push them to older hardware or you can uh, you know, change the number of replicas that your old data has so that you're not, you're, you're not concerned about the, the quick searches as much and you don't want to burn that much disk. What kind of hardware are you running it on now? What kind of volume? Um, I have four VMs. I think they have four gigs of RAM each. And we're able to index about 10,000 events per second. Um, and it, it seems to do fine running on a VM, um, and at, at least at CMU, it's still very much a proof of concept. The Brownian's highly experimental, the plugin's highly experimental, and really this is just to determine what kind of hardware we want behind it, and how much we want to store, and how fast the searcher should be. But um, just VMware. Yep. Um, You, I'm using it in pseudo production, and I, I'm I'm being encouraged by my bosses to keep doing that. So so we'll see. But uh, I, I will say the first time I actually installed it, I think I got compromised by browser. <laughs> um, I guess you mentioned the demo. Okay, I I will get to that. So uh, so Seth was kind enough to set up a box. Uh, that has some PCAP data on it that anybody can go in and poke around and get a feel for it without having to go and set it up yourself um, if you want to, uh, to to try it out without really committing. Yep. Not yet. <laughs> we'll talk. 
But let's talk about the installation. That is the installation to install Elasticsearch. You grab the package, you install it, and then it has some really sensible defaults. If perhaps you don't like the defaults, this is what my current configuration of Elasticsearch looks like. I use Puppet to provision my Elasticsearch VMs, so that's why you see the funky host name in there. Uh, by default, Elasticsearch will give you really crazy random names that try to be funny with vampire, sword, girl. Um, so I usually just throw the host name in there. I give it a more descriptive cluster name. Uh, I tell it to uh, go ahead and mlock all the memory that I assign to it. And I tell it that instead of using opt Elasticsearch for data storage, I have a separate partition on data that it should use. Uh, the package installs an Elasticsearch user uh, by default that everything will run as. And then in the defaults, I go ahead and set the heap size to something that makes sense. Um, so I think these were, this was off a more powerful box that had eight gigs, and uh, I generally give about 75% for the heap and 25% to the OS and everything else. Um, so yeah, this is all of the changes I've done to the out-of-the-box Elasticsearch configuration, and it seems to be working pretty well. And at the same time, there are lots of tunables and tweakables, and you can change uh, merge policies and flush policies and all this other stuff that uh, I, I think uh, will add many benefits as people start playing around with those. There is. You can, uh, you can do unicast discovery where you give it a list of IP addresses that it should use instead. Uh, what I've been doing is just leaving the multicast auto discovery on and using IP tables um, since I don't want to have to go and redo it whenever I bring up a new uh, node or anything like that. Um, so in terms of the clustering, uh, this is just uh, some samples from the Elasticsearch log. Uh, that I have running on one of the systems. So it went out, hit the multicast IP address, it, it got the information of these are the node members and this is the current master. Um, for, and then you see that the master was shut down and a new master was elected and it automatically uh, updated all the nodes to that. In terms of the bro configuration, um, I'm doing a very aggressive, I don't want ASCII logs at all at the moment. So I'm just redefining my default writer to be Elasticsearch. And I give it the IP address of, the Elast of my Elasticsearch server. Um, and then in bro control, I give it a log rotation interval. Uh, so that's three hours, so it'll create an index, a new index every three hours. Uh, the indices have uh, bro dash uh, timestamp in there so you can kind of know. And again, it also update this meta index so that when you're working with Brownian, it knows exactly uh, which indices to work with. If you change the log rotation interval midway uh, through everything, it'll make sure to query only the indices you, you care about because if you're only looking at a specific time, there's no sense in getting the performance hit for querying outside of that range. And finally, some more information. Um, Elasticsearch, is that Elasticsearch.org. They recently formed a company that sells support for Elasticsearch. Uh, so if you want to set this up and you feel scared using open source software and want to buy some actual enterprise level support, they do offer that. Um, the Bro 2.1 beta has uh, a documentation uh, file on um, how to set up logging with Elasticsearch. Um, Though, again, there, there are sensible defaults in there. Um, if you just run it out of the box with a new log writer, it'll assume that you're running an Elasticsearch server on the manager, um, and it'll just try logging stuff there uh, for a test uh, or for low traffic instances that might very well make sense. Um, Brownian itself is up on GitHub. Again, I don't expect people to know how to spell my name, so just Googling Brownian and Bro or Brownian Elasticsearch should, should get you where you want to go, and it's also referenced in the logging Elasticsearch documentation file. 
And if you want to play with a demo in a few hours when the DNS updates, uh, it's available on brownian.broids.org.